start recording from this moment, if you like. We move into preliminary matters. Uh, we have um, a two uh, minutes of the previous meetings. Um, excuse me, I, excuse me, could you introduce yourself so we know who you are? We don't normally do that. We, we don't normally do that. Everybody has a. Well, I can't see who you are from here. I'm going to press on with the meeting, and and, and if I may say, you know, we, I'm, I'm assuming that everybody is going to be respectful, and uh, and, and uh, follow the normal procedures for meetings. Uh, I, I don't think, like Barack Obama, that we're going to have to sing mm -hmm. to uh, to to sort of bring order back again, but. We, we will proceed with the meeting, I'm chairing the meeting, and we'll carry on if you don't mind. So we go on to minutes of the previous meetings. Those are on pages 7 to 20. Uh, are they agreed? Agreed. 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 Thank you. Um, the, there is a, uh, an issue about declarations of interest. If any members have any declarations of interest. If there's any um, <coughs> suggestions about the changes in the agenda, the, the uh, Items of business. Councillor Lennon. Uh, Chair, could I ask, because there are so many members of the public and obviously ward councillors for the uh, items on the agenda 7 and 8 in relation to Sorbo Massey, would you um, be willing uh, to perhaps uh, uh, rearrange the order of business in order to facilitate them for an early getaway, or is there a reason perhaps why that may not be possible? We have had some discussions about this. There are a number of items. It, they won't be long, I don't think, um, uh, that, that relate to the, the financial background to the authority, which I think would be helpful to the members of the public to understand the context against which we're making some discussions. There is also proposals for changes and amalgamations in uh, St. Helens. And I think, again, I don't think it'll be a long item, but I think for the public who are here to look at decisions further down the agenda, it will be useful and interesting to see you know, that, that it is not just in isolation, there are other items on the agenda as well. So if, if you don't mind, I think we, can, we will... Would you give order, please? Um, we, we will proceed with the agenda as it's printed, if that's all right. But if it gets lengthy, if it gets into lengthy, we'll look at that, because I, I know the public have got some distance to travel, but um, we'll stick with the agenda as printed, if you don't mind. So we'll move on to um, item three on the agenda. That's pages 21 to 30, and that is the petition concerning the merger of Upton and West Kirby Fire Stations. Now, I think there is a, a member of the public who is wishing to present a petition to the authority. Is that not right? No. No, I don't think she knew that he was getting presented today. Okay, fine. So we move on to item. Okay. So we move. We move on to item four then, and that le le relates to a deputation. And now I understand that there's a deputation who wants to come and give a presentation before the authority today. Would there be somebody, a spokesman for that deputation, sir? Would you like? Would you like to stand and, and give uh, the? We've just outlined the procedure for the help and assistance of the public. If possible, uh, with regard to deputations. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. We will in a moment. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Um, if I can just explain that the um, authorities' constitution standing orders require that a deputation um, can be uh, addressed, uh, be addressing the authority. Uh, however, there is a limit of an up to five minute um, address and this can be followed by a further five minutes of questions from members of the authority. Um, however, I do um, have to say at this point that that, um, that question and answer session does not form a debate uh, because uh, clearly this is not part of any ongoing consultation. Thank you. Thank you. There's a spur seat at the end here and with a microphone if you'd like to step forward and use that. Stand or sit as you prefer. Do you want you to do it now? Yes, ma'am. How does this work? Just press the button. Just press the button. Yeah. Press the button. Yeah. You're on. Right. Uh, my name's Les Spencer. I'm the chairman of the Sorbo Massey Village Conservation Area Society. I'm communicating the majority view of the householders and members who are opposing the plan you're considering <coughs> today, namely to build a new fire station on Greenbelt land, a 
adjacent to our conservation area and directly opposite a listed grade two historic stone bridge. Time does not permit me to present the full extent of our opposition, but we hope you will appreciate that the argument is not as black and white as the Chief Fire Officer has been suggesting. At this moment, I'm unable to fully illustrate the impact of loss of amenity use, uh, breach of green dog policy, habitat loss, public nuisance to adjacent sheltered housing, and a projected drop in the nearby property values estimated at 10%. I have prioritised other concerns. The Chief Fire Officer has repeatedly stressed that there is no alternative operational response, no plan B. The intention to build in this location has been presented as a matter of dire public safety for residents impacted by the closure of the West Kirby station. I hesitate to describe his tone as scaremongering, but that's how it seemed at times. As the committee should be aware, the West Kirby Horleg Mills area has had no cover from the West Kirby station for half of the last two years as it has been operationally closed for half of every week with call-outs covered from Upton. Presumably a risk assessment was conducted by the fire authority and it was felt that closure for approximately 180 days a year didn't unacceptably compromise residential safety in the West Kirby area. Indeed, we believe that call-out response times of 10 minutes from Upton to the area concerned is broadly comparable to national averages and to many other parts of Merseyside. Why is it currently acceptable to provide fire and emergency cover from Upton, but apparently of such critical importance to do it from the proposed Sobel Massey Greenbelt site in the future? If it is felt that response times from Upton to West Kirby need shortening, then why doesn't the fire authority use one small targeted response vehicle to complement the larger appliances on a consolidated improved site at Upton? That would cost a lot less than the 4.2 million anticipated for the Sobel Massey station. Like the ambulance services, these vehicles can be on standby on the road awaiting call-outs, but based from Upton. Why is it that Merseyside, which is one of the larger UK fire authorities, still sends out fully manned large appliances to minor call-outs? Is there inter internal union resistance to more flexible operational responses? Is this reliance upon large appliances dictating operational restructure in this case? It is clear that Merseyside Fire Authority have set a precedent that cover for West Kirby can be safely provided from Upton. So there is, despite what the Chief Fire Officer says, an option B, and that's closing West Kirby and redeveloping Upton. There's also a plan C, and that's to employ a smaller targeted response vehicle to supplement cover from Upton. This development completely hinges upon getting permission to build on Greenbelt land. Emergency services can seek plan of permission on Greenbelt land if they can prove very special circumstances and only where there are no alternatives. We contend that there is a workable alternative and that is based upon the redevelopment of Upton, but for whatever reason this hasn't been fully publicly <coughs> debated. There are also financial aspects of this development that seem to compromise public perceptions of transparency and suggest conflicts of interest in the planning process. There's clearly a conflict of interest that the sellers of the Sorval Massey land are World Council whose officers will adjudicate approval of any planning application and also whether very special circumstances are actually present. <coughs> the land is currently worthless, but with planning will be much more valuable. What price and terms have been agreed for the fire authority to acquire this land? Who will actually pay for it, Merseyside Fire Authority or by grant from central government? How much capital inflow does the authority expect from the sales of West Kirby and Upton? <coughs> Forgive us for being cynical, but might the drivers of this development be mostly financial and the perceived safety needs of West Kirby residents a convenience to justify the development. The fire authority stands to gain the resale revenue of Upton and West Kirby, and Will Council might be receiving a commercial price for an otherwise worthless piece of land. From a cash flow position, that seems like a win for everyone other than the local residents. <coughs> Furthermore, we gather that this scheme in principle has been approved by central government for a 1.49 million DCLG grant. But might that be predicated upon an exaggeration of the dangers of longer response times to West Kirby? Do the grant providers know that an adequate service is already being provided from Upton for 50% of each week, and that redevelopment of Upton would cost a public purse a fraction of the 4.2 million total cost of the new Sorgo Massey station? Our feeling is that very special circumstances might be being inflated to circumvent Greenbelt protection and to achieve financial restructuring benefits and access to central government grants. It looks as though special <coughs> circumstances <coughs> are, further, are, nearly finished, are further being boosted by attempts to involve Merseyside Police and Northwest Ambulance Services as subsidiary tenants. 
However, neither party has shown any expression of interest, so I hope they will be excluded from the planning consideration. Much is said about the health and safety benefits to West Kirby by moving to Sorgo Massey, but what of the lengthening response now, please, in first. What about the lengthening response times uh, for Upton? The primary dangers are to places like Arab Park Hospital. Okay, that's, you've had the time now. Um, as, we, uh, as we have a... Well, before we come to questions... I was just going to say, is there no facility to allow an extra two more minutes? I don't need two minutes. Probably 30 seconds would be enough. No, we've, we've, had, we've had the five minutes. We don't want to listen to the consultation. We don't want to listen to this. What we, what we will do is ask if we've had one view, one side of the view, if you like, is there anybody in the audience with a contrary position to that who would like to make a point? What, in favour of the five minutes? In favour of it? No, no. But we've had that side of the argument in balance and in fairness happens at all local authorities, if there is one side of a presentation, <coughs> if there is a, a, a contrary view to that presentation, they must be given an opportunity as well. Is there anybody who has a contrary view to what has been said? Sir? I'm Sir, I'm sorry to use... You just say who you are. Yeah, I'm sorry to use on the vice chair of the side after you. It's just all the sort of Would you like to come and use yeah. the microphone? Again, you will be given five minutes to make a presentation. Then we will move on into questioning. Some of the points, sir, that you might have made could be picked up in questions. I don't know. Yeah, I'm Tommy Hughes. I'm the Vice Chair of the Merseyside Fire Brigade Union. The other major have been given comments from our Fund Brigade Secretary, who will force and can't be here as his own reason for meeting you. These viewpoints do reflect the viewpoint of the Merseyside Fire Brigade Union. Five years union first, I'd like to state, always applauds local communities when they come together to fight unnecessary and damaging cuts to essential services. The FBU in this instance agree with the Chief Fire Officer and with the Fire Authority. The fire station is staffed with firefighters 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's the most effective way to immediately deploy firefighters into their communities to save and preserve life. We also agree that fire engines staffed with five firefighters is the safest and most efficient way to deal with the multitude of different rescue scenarios that firefighters can face every day of their working lives. <coughs> Therefore, the FBU are committed to defend whole time fire cover in Merseyside and also to fight to protect safe and effective criminals. On a purely professional level and as firefighters, we're fundamentally opposed to the use of small fire units or target response vehicles. Their very name gives an insight into the limitations of these vehicles. They can only safely and effectively deal with small fires. What they do is they divert valuable funding away from maintaining fully staffed and crucially fully equipped fire appliances. Firefighters clearly need the correct tools for the job to carry out effective rescues wherever and whenever that may need to be the case. Sending firefighters to emergency incidents in transit vans or in cars severely limits what we're able to do when we arrive at those incidents. I'm sure I want to debate the original cliche that in these situations every second really does count. Every firefighter on every station in the country with their whole views. I'd also like to say, it's not your firefighters, it's not the chief fire officer, and it's not the authority who have caused this situation to arise. It's the government who have forced this situation. It's the government who have forced the situation on the fire service and on the communities of Greasy and Solo Massey. In light of recent events in Europe and North Africa, and the potential for terrorist attacks in the UK, these cuts, I'm sure you'd agree, look even more dangerous. That's why the Fire Brigade Union are committed to continuing to fight these cuts, both locally and nationally. Although we do fear there is yet worse to come. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. So, thank you, sir. So now there will be for members to ask questions for five minutes, if there are any questions that members have. <coughs> Can I just ask if it's now the appropriate time for the 
Yeah, because it was said that this is not a this is not a debate. Mm -hmm. that, that this is for the members of the public <coughs> to make the delegation to make the and we if we like we go into the agenda and we pick up any of these points in the agenda proper. This is it is not part of the, it's, it's a it's a delegation point made alternative view and we'll we'll get into the issues within the reports themselves. Go on. Just to uh, respond to Councillor Rennie, all of the points raised uh, by both parties are covered within the reports on the agenda, Chair. Councillor Bavon. Thanks, uh, Chair. It's a question for the FPU. Um, what are the Robert E. Insulin's that you as a file officer have to attend? I think it should be the point of view. How many are actually fired and how many are road traffic accidents or anything else? And not just for me. Yeah, I don't personally have. I know possibly where we're going with this. What do you think? Is that fire calls are decreasing as a machine, is the point that you're making. However, we pointed it towards the target which wants to be able to it's towards the small fires units. Is that potentially a luxury when you do have funding to be able to use them as supplement? However, when the funding for those vehicles and the personnel of vehicles is going to be taken out of the incredibly tight budget, that money, quite clearly for me, from an operational purpose, needs to go to funding, fully equipped and fully staffed fire engines, so it's available to respond to all types of incidents, as I say, not just to small fires, it seems to be funding that's directed in a place where it can be better used elsewhere. I'd just like to ask you what is your response to as opposed to the rest of the country, and given the fact that we have whole time firefighters. I could say that the figure for the response time is in the package of chief would you be able to say? Yeah, yes. yeah, but for, for everybody here today, the response time as opposed to other, other fire departments, the fact that sense. we're held time. Maybe the chief will pick that up during okay. the presentation, in his presentation, for the down agenda. Are there any other questions regarding the delegation point and counterpoint? If not, we'll move on uh, because uh, we did say that we would deal <coughs> next with. Uh, item uh, 5, Revenue and Capital Outturn. Um, this is pages 31 to 62. Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, this report details the financial year end position and the final accounts for 2014 and 2015. Uh, members will recall that the authority set a two year financial plan that required savings of £6.3 million <coughs> over a two year period. The, the financial year in question 2014-15 and 2015-16. To deliver that £6.3 million pounds, uh, required savings of £2.9 million from back office support and technical areas. But despite that uh, large scale saving, that still left an unavoidable £3.4 million required from operational response. <coughs> £3.4 million equates to a reduction in nearly 100 firefighter posts by natural retirement rates. Uh, and that was to be achieved over an extended time period and would result in a, a further reduction in the number of appliances that could be staffed. Uh, the fire authority, having already gone from 42 uh, appliances to 28, uh, recognised that this would mean a reduction to probably uh, a, a reduction of probably a further four <coughs> appliances. Uh, after an extensive consultation, it was considered that this might best be deliver delivered by three station managers in Nosley, Westworld and St Helens, and an outright closure in Liverpool and uh, specific reports around those measures are uh, elsewhere on the agenda. Uh, the accounts that are um, as, as presented today um, present the position at the end of 2014 15 the first of those two years. Ostensibly, it's good news in that whilst the, the 6.3 million is yet to be delivered in full, we have delivered the savings that we expected <coughs> to up to the end of year one, slightly faster than we expected and uh, we're ahead of the game by about £1.2 million. Pounds. Uh, this is for three reasons. Uh, firefighter retirement's been slightly ahead of schedule, uh, but obviously the, the downside to that is it, it makes it harder and harder to maintain fire engine availability as the numbers of staff are reducing. Uh, secondly, back office and support savings have been delivered quicker than expected. And thirdly, um, pay restraints have been in place for all staff, with uh, pay awards being settled at 1%. Uh, there is still work to do, however, and the, the full firefighter retirements required to achieve the savings of 100 posts 
won't be delivered until um, next year. In addition, depending on authority decisions later on the agenda, the structural changes to support uh, that reduced number of staff won't be achieved for at least a, a couple of years uh, henceforth um, if, if um, we proceed with the station mergers and planning and building and all the time taken there. The Chancellor sets his emergency, emergency budget in a little over a week's time and all sounding seems to suggest that there will be major cuts for local government and fire and rescue services over the next few years. Probably those cuts will be on the same trajectory as the spending review period just finished. And for uh, the fire authority here, we have um, uh, the away day uh, in, in just over a, a, a fortnight's time, um, where we'll be dealing with significant concerns that compulsory redundancy for firefighters may be unavoidable. So whilst therefore it seems like good news, and we're ahead of where we expected to be on the current round of cuts, uh, it's my expectation that we'll hit 2016-17 and, and the next round of cuts not having fully delivered the current financial plan in terms of either actual staff reductions or having delivered the infrastructure changes needed to reflect the reduction in the staff as firefighters retire. Members will recall that their confirmed strategy is to build up a capital investment reserve to support the infrastructure changes that are proposed and therefore avoid borrowing to fund uh, capital investment. Since of course any borrowing adds pressure to the revenue budget because the borrowing has to be repaid. Therefore, the report recommends that the, uh, the underspending of 1.2 million is used to top up the, the capital investment reserve. I think the, the only other matter to bring to your attention is that in relation to earmarked reserves, and it's an issue touched upon by Councillor Gladden, uh, there's been significant concern, concern from the authority about the uh, rise in the number of uh, road traffic collisions during the year, uh, through the scrutiny committees and so on and uh, £100,000 has been set aside in a reserve to work with partners uh, to work around reducing the number of uh, RTCs um, uh, over the next couple of years. Um, copies of the, the draft accounts themselves um, are available. Um, at this stage under the legislation, I'm responsible for signing those off, and they will then be subject to audit during July and August, and the final audited accounts will come back to the, the authority in September to sign up. Probably best if I stop there and uh, take any questions on the accounts. So, members, uh, any questions uh, relating to item five on the agenda? Yeah, just, just to make comments, Chair. Um, I know we haven't saved the six and a half million yet, although you've done very, very well to get the 1.2 million for your shot, and I know we have to do the mergers. Just very concerned, uh, Kieran. We know there's going to be an announcement next week in the House where there'll be more cuts coming. And we know that there's going to be the autumn statement, which happens, I don't know why they call it the autumn statement, because it happens just before Christmas. And it does not look good. It really does not look good. So I'm afraid that we are going to have to invest to save in the future. So I welcome that you're coming that into that investment. Thank you. Okay. Um, that's the financial context update for members. I just have to turn. Thanks, Chair. Uh, it's a comprehensive uh, report and I uh, went through it quite a lot. And you can see within it uh, the amount of reductions uh, that had to be made. Is this direct because of budget cuts to the authority that we're having to make such drastic cuts throughout the last 12 months and the forthcoming time? Is, is that the reason behind this? Through the chair, yes, the, um, the fire authority is funded approximately 70% from central government funding and 30% from council tax. And as uh, members will be well aware, there have been significant cuts to government funding in recent times in response to um, the pressures on public finances. Um, so the, those cuts in our um, grant funding um, have led to the reductions um, which, which we're faced with and the savings. I think it, 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 good response, and thanks very much for this response. I think it's, it's necessary for the members of the public to know exactly why we're having to make such drastic cuts in public safety, uh, because that's in essence what the fire authority do, is to serve the public for safe communities. Uh, and I thank you for the answer. I think that the wider public need to know the reason behind why we're having to, to do that and why the wider public should be supporting the fire authority 
and any protests that are making should be made directly to the government. Thanks, Chairman. Yes, thank you very much. What point are you on, Mary? Is that this, I mean, um, thank, you, thank you, Chairman. I mean, I listened to our discussion about the Chamber of Commerce and Trade, and I think that savings having to be made by the authority, but just for perhaps his benefit and again benefit for the members of the public here, perhaps the um, Deputy Chief Executive could just outline how, when did these cuts start, because clearly it wasn't just, it isn't just now with the present government, it isn't with the last government, in fact from my recollection, these cuts and the reductions that we've been making, although clearly they are, they are becoming more and more severe and acute, but it's been a long time overall in my time here on the Fire Authority, which I think is Thanks, Chair. I think it would be fair to say that the Foreign Authority has faced um, budget cuts over a, an extended period of time, um, going back over a, a decade ago. Um, the Foreign Authority had about 1,500 firefighters and has had to make savings. Um, it is without doubt that they have accelerated in recent times through the most recent spending review um, as the cuts have been applied to the whole of the public sector and in particular those areas of, of local government which are not protected from their cuts. In previous, you understand what I'm saying, in, in previous governments, in previous financial settlements, we had floors and ceilings, mm. and the list of fire authority was generally at the floor, and we were also allowed to go up 2% and 4%, remember our budget planning was a 4% increase, I think it's the past five years where we've seen a 50% and more reduction in our grant, a third reduction in our budget. Um, a double the national average reduction for other fire authorities in our budget. And I think members will know from the briefings that we're starting to get that what we're looking at is a, a further 30% of cuts in the next three years. 14% next year, 9% is it, and then 7% all the way around. So this, we've had big challenges, we know that. We've got some more big challenges to, to come. All I would say is that, as a country, the government seems to have said we no longer want comprehensive fire insurance. We don't really even want, it's not just us, it's the whole country. We don't really even want third party fire and theft. We just want you know, the basic minimum that we can get. And that's a challenge that will face the country and Merseyside and the city <coughs> in years to come. Which is why our chairman is in Harrogate today lobbying, you know, for a better slice of the cake and a better settlement. Because, you know, as it's often said, when people are running out of terrorist and fire incidents, our firefighters and our good people are running in. And we need to support those people as a whole community. Okay, well, on, uh, on item five on, on the budget, uh, on the finance rather, any other questions or points? Thank you. So we move on to six proposals for Eccleston and Eccleston Fire Station, page 63 on the um, Chief? Thanks, Chair. Yeah, members, the purpose of this report is that you approve a 12 week period of public consultation commencing on the 3rd of August over the two proposals which are listed in your report at uh, paragraphs 1 and 2, which is at the top of page 64. That is, to consider the merger of Eccleston and St. Helens at a new station on Canal Street, which is in St. Helens Town Centre, and the redesignation of one of the two existing whole time fire appliances to whole time retained. That would be on a 30 minute recall, so to be clear, that is not on an immediate response. Or alternately, members, it would be the uh, the other alternative to deliver the same amount of savings would be the outlet closure of Eccleston Fire Station. You are well aware by now, not least because of the previous uh, report that Kieran has just spoken to, of the cuts, the in-year cuts to the authority budget for this financial year, which have already taken effect as of the 1st of April. In practical terms, therefore, we now have to make all of the structural changes to reflect the financial reality, which are the uh, outlet station closures, which you've already agreed to and we've implemented at uh, Allerton on the 1st of April, 
and the station mergers and Nosley, which have already approved, uh, West Wirral, which you will consider later on on the agenda, and finally in St Helens, which is uh, what you're being asked to consider now, subject, of course, to the outcomes of public consultation. Uh, with the exception of our new members, are conscious we have two new members here today, who uh, joined us after the AGM uh, in June. You'll all be well aware of the background to the merger proposals, the detail of which is contained within your report at paragraph 6 through 11, which is on pages 64 to 66. Uh, there are other options you could consider, and they are detailed within Appendix A, which is uh, pages 73 to 77, that's your public consultation document. I've not recommended any of them to you, as because, quite simply, the merger proposal does deliver the least impact on, uh, on operational response. Uh, that is a fact in St. Helens, just the same way as it's a fact in Knowsley and in West Wirral. Or indeed throughout the country, where mergers have been used extensively as a means to deliver savings over the course of the last spend and review. That is most obvious in West Yorkshire, where a total of eight mergers have been or are in the process of being implemented. That is, the closure of 16 fire stations to build eight new stations, which is the same as that which we are proposing you do here. As you're aware, members, the merger principle is simple. It involves identify, uh, identifying the midpoint between two whole-time fire stations and then identifying land as close as possible to the, mid, uh, the midpoint on which to build a new fire station. Appendix B on page 79 shows the locations of all the sites that have been identified through working with our partners in St. Helens Council. Appendix C on pages 81 through to 85 describes the methodology that we use to determine optimum locations to site our fire stations and then how we uh, calculate the run times from the fixed location that is the fire station. And that same methodology has been applied to all of the merger proposals. <coughs> One viable site for the St Helens merger is the Canal Street section of the Pilkington's Watson Street Works, which is shown on the map at Appendix D, which is on page 87. The site's exa uh, exactly equidistant between the two existing stations and therefore is the optimum location. Uh, Colin Schofield and I have held talks with the MDOP Pilkingtons and we have a joint commitment to work together to secure the land required on the site to build a new fire station should members, after considering the outcomes <coughs> of the public consultation, approve the merger proposal. The table at paragraph 17 on page 67 shows a comparison between the average run times for Eccleston and St Helens from 2008-9 to 2014-15. Uh, what you'll see, members, is the St Helens average run times are broadly similar, whereas the Eccleston run times have increased. Uh, members are well aware of the reasons why it's no longer possible to staff all of the non-key stations. Uh, or the, the appliances rather all the time, so I won't repeat that now, but Kieran effectively has explained that on the, uh, on the previous report. Paragraph 18 details the predicted mean average run times for incidents on the St Helens and Eccleston station areas from the Canal Street site, which are 5 minutes 26 seconds and 4 minutes 47 seconds respectively. The mean average run times for the combined station area is predicted at 5 minutes and 12 seconds. Ordinarily members, a merger would not result in a faster response time, but in all circumstances it would reduce the overall impact on response times compared to any other structural change option. On this occasion, however, it does <coughs> result in a faster run time, which is a result of the proximity of the proposed site on Canal Street to the arterial route that run through St. Helens, which is specifically the St. Helens Linkway, which can be clearly seen on Appendix D, and which members from that area will be aware was built sometime after the two existing fire stations. 
To be clear, members, this proposal still involves changing the crewing of one of the two existing whole time fire appliances to whole time retain, thus introducing a 30 minute delay in its response. To be clear, members, we would only ever use that as a strategic reserve, i.e., it gets recalled in when the number of available appliances that we have drops below a certain trigger point. Appendix A on page 89 shows you the 10 minute response isochrome which covers the existing stations. Appendix F on page 91 shows the 10 minute isochrome from Canal Street. Appendix G on page 93 shows you the graduated 5 to 10 minute response coverages from the existing stations. Whereas Appendix H on page 95 shows you the graduated 5 to 10 minute response coverage from Canal Street. What you'll see, members, is that the areas that are not covered by the 10 minute isochrones are minimal. They contain very few properties. They are in the north end of Rainford, around Rainford Junction, the north end of Billings, and the south end of Bold Heath, where for anyone who knows that area will know there is very little, if any, housing at all. What I would say is that the areas, so, or if you like, the beyond 10 minute coverage are virtually identical through either, either the existing option or the merger option. As with all the other merger proposals, the merge station would house two appliances, as I've explained previously, one of which is whole time, one of which is whole time detained on the 30 minute recall. If members were to approve the proposal, then officers will commence a period of 12 week public consultation effective from the 3rd of August. A copy of the consultation plan is attached to Appendix J on page 99 of your report and reflects that which officers have undertaken previously in Mosley and West Wirral. The alternative to the merger is the outright closure of Eccleston Fire Station and the relocation of the Eccleston clients to the existing St. Helens Fire Station at Parstocks Road again to be crewed whole time detained on the 30 minute recall. <coughs> if we were to close Eccleston outright, the mean average uh, response time to life risk incidents would increase to 6 minutes 44 seconds, which is 1 minute and 57 seconds longer than if the merger proposal is approved. It is for that reason, members, that my recommendation to you is to proceed with the consultation process over the merger option. Either of the options will deliver a reduction of the 22 whole time equivalent post required to deliver one quarter of the £3.4 million savings assumed to be delivered from the Nosley, West Wirral and St Helens merger proposals and the outright closure of Allerton in Liverpool. The Equalities Impact Assessment for the merger, closures and other operational response proposals is attached at Appendix NT report which is on pages 107 to 134 and will be developed further once any consultation process is concluded. I'm conscious that there is uh, a great deal of information on this report for you to digest members and also conscious that uh, there is a wish to uh, move through the agenda so I'll pause at that point to take any questions that you might have. Thank you. Uh, members, if members have any questions, Councillor Malone. Yes, thanks Chairman. And I speak as the member for St. Helens here when I speak. Um, I've read this report line by line. And one, that, uh, one line that actually stood out to me is on page 69 of the report under uh, paragraph 30. And it says the merger is the preferred least worst option. Thank you for telling us the truth. This is the least worst option that we have to do. I know we have to do it. We've six and a half million still to find. And if we don't do this, make these cuts, then I know somebody will come into this authority and make these cuts on our behalf. So it's up to us to stand by it. I would be very, very sorry to lose Eccleston Station. It's not what the people of St. Helens wanted, but it's what the will have to have. It does need more spending on it. And it is an old area. However, Stocks Road, far too big for purpose. Uh, not comfortable for anybody to work in. Um, it has no disabled access, the community can't get into the building. So we do agree that a new build has to be done within that area. I have 
concerns over the Canal Street area, and my concern is there is contaminated land down that area of St. Helens, with it being the Pilkington's company that had it. And this government has now not just cut the contaminated land budget, they have stopped it altogether. So there's no more making bad land good. There's no money coming from this government to do that. So would that, can I ask the Chief, would that funding have to be paid by Merseyside Fire or can we, can we do an agreement with Pilkington on the sale of the land? Thanks, Councillor Maloney. Just to um, just pick up on the first point that Councillor Maloney uh, made, and uh, members will be aware that it, the officers have always tried to uh, be as open, transparent, and, and, and honest with you around the, uh, the situation, which is that there are no options that we can recommend to you that are going to uh, improve performance. The fact of the matter is that we are very much in the game here of. Uh, as mitigating as much as we can the impact on the uh, the operational response capability of the service and we try to uh, articulate that within the, the consultation documentation which uh, I, I think that we, we certainly do through the uh, setting out the, the alternative <coughs> options none of which say so all of which would lead to a, uh, a worse outcome in terms of the land remediation uh, that would be a matter of dialogue and negotiation between ourselves and, uh, and Pilkington. So uh, whilst clearly we would seek to get the best outcome we could for the authority in that regard, uh, until such time as those negotiations were concluded, that couldn't be uh, more definitive than, uh, than that. But I, uh, I take the point the, uh, the council makes. Yeah. Yeah. Can we come back then, Chair? Thanks very much for that. Um, I have looked at it, I have spoke to people about it, and I, I see it that it's our job here today to get the best operational response that we can for the people of St. Helens. So I would fully like to support the recommendation that it goes out to consultation within the St. Helens Borough. So, uh, unless there are any other questions <coughs> uh, or observations from members, you uh, look to page 64, <coughs> recommendations are there in paragraph 4, which is to undertake uh, approve a 12 week period of public consultation, and five following consultation to bring the report back. That's been moved. Is that agreed? Agreed. 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 Thank you. Uh, so we'll move on to item 7, uh, which is pages 135 to 370. We will fire cover consultation number 2, outcomes chief. Uh, thanks, Chair. The purpose of this report is to inform members of the outcomes of the 12-week public consultation process of the proposal to merge Upton and West Kirby fire stations at a new station on Sogo Massey Road as an alternative to <coughs> the outlet closure of West Kirby fire station. As we've stated uh, previously, members, in either option, one of the two existing whole time fire appliances is be designated all time retained on a 30 minute recall for resilience purposes as that is required to deliver the reduction of 22 all time equivalent posts which is how the savings are made. Uh, paragraphs 15 to 21 on pages 137 describe, uh, sorry 137 to 138 rather describe how we publicise the consultation process. Appendix 1 at paragraph 151 to 168, sorry, Appendix 1 pages 151 to the state of 167.